to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. And in this episode, we are pitting Catwoman versus Hellcat. It's going to be a good fight. Everybody knows Catwoman. I don't think most people are familiar with Hellcat, unless, of course, you watch Jessica Jones, where she's played by Rachel Taylor and played a prominent role in season three, which we reviewed last week. If you didn't watch Jessica Jones, you may also be aware of Hellcat from the Defenders comics, where she's a primary member of the Defenders team. Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting match. We'll get into that later on in the episode. But before that, we're going to break down Marvel and DC news from the past week. Full disclaimer, we are actually recording this episode a day earlier than what we normally do. Uh, So if we miss any news that comes out on Monday, we'll just address it in the following episode. In this episode, we'll be talking about the Black Widow set photos that seemingly confirm Yelena Belova and possibly Taskmaster as being in the film. And we'll also talk about the Teen Titans Go vs. Teen Titans trailer that dropped earlier this week. As always, feel free to jump around in this episode as we put our segment times in our episode description. A quick shout out to Yurani Gami OG, the last son of Krypton, Childish Victorino, and Shifjudbik for the reviews of the show on Apple Podcasts. As you guys know, we're trying to get to 200 ratings, and as of this recording, we're at 122 ratings. Huge jump. Huge, huge jump from huge last jump. week. We're going to make it. I feel like we're going to make it. We're so close. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, don't try to be the hero that gets us to the 200th rating. Yeah, because be the hero who gets us to 123. Right, exactly. We will appreciate all of you equally, okay? So if you're if you're holding out, waiting to get us to 200, just don't. <laughs> Help us get to 200. Right. Thank you to everyone who's left us a review and rating. And we are trying to get to 200 ratings because at that point we'll become eligible to have our reviews for Marvel and DC films count toward the official Rotten Tomatoes tomato meter. It's a huge goal of ours. Love to see it happen. So please help us out if you can. Uh, With that all out of the way, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out up until the 90s to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award that we post on social media that Jonathan personally draws for those who we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week's question was more of a creative writing assignment. We asked you to write us your own one-sentence description of a deleted scene from Avengers Endgame that you would love to see. And that was based off of the news that Avengers Endgame would be released this past weekend with an additional deleted scene at the end credits. Now, I haven't actually seen that deleted scene yet because I actually have my tickets to go see the film after we record this episode. The reason we're recording it a day early is because Jonathan's going camping this week and I didn't know that was going to happen. So, uh, yeah, we won't be talking about that deleted scene from Endgame for this episode, but if it's worth talking about, we'll talk about it in the next episode. If you happen to give us an answer after Sunday, June 30th afternoon, uh, just know that your answer was special and that you're special. We got a ton of answers for this a question. A shit ton. Yeah. Everyone who's ever given us an answer gave us an answer this week as well. But there's a lot of great answers here. So uh, we'll go into the honorable mentions first. Real quick, we asked for a one-sentence answer. If you gave us more than one sentence... We condense that into one sentence for you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> it was a lot of work. <laughs> uh, but honorable mention goes to NML Dad for writing a scene showing Cap when he returns Mjolnir to Asgard. Dustin Belcom gave the answer, Riri Williams accepts a package from the mail carrier and out pops an AI of Tony Stark. That would be cool. Riri Williams, of course, is Ironheart in the comics. She was Iron Man for a while. Shannon Sanderson wrote Deadpool popping up out of nowhere during the battle scene and taking the gauntlet from Tony saying, I got this, Mr. Tin Man, and destroys Thanos himself. (laughs) That would make sense since Deadpool would be able to heal from the snap. Right. Probably anyway. Um, Irani Gami answered, Howard the Duck, Rocket, and Cosmo the Dog have a short but funny dialogue regarding their anthropomorphic status in the MCU and possibly hinting at the existence of other similar characters such as Spider-Ham or Titus. But a winter rates, the power stone breaks, then we pan to the Watcher holding baby Galactus with an OMG look on his face. But what, Galactus has never been a baby. Yeah, if you want to learn more about Galactus, go ahead and check out our Galactus vs. the Spectre episode. Joel Seagrave wrote, A crack in space appears following Tony Stark using the Infinity Gauntlet in the final battle, and you hear, I hunger, with Galactus's hand or eye appearing in the crack. <laughs> the crack. Ew. Honorable mention goes to Victor, who wrote that he wants a cameo by Johnny DC, you, yeah. in the big fight scene against Thanos, because one, 
he's the better looking one, true. which is not true. True. Two, he's smarter, not true. Very true. And three, wears tights all the time anyway. Very true. Which is true, yes. <laughs> Kevin Amai wrote, I want to see the defenders, Luke, Jessica, Matt, and Frank, enter and fight in the final battle. That would have been amazing. It would have been such an easy cameo to do, too. That would have meant that they would have been dusted, though. That's fine. <laughs> Although I would like to see Danny in that group as well. He was left out of that answer. Honorable mention goes to Nick Abanto, who wrote, As all the heroes step through the sling ring portals, another portal opens, and the Justice League steps through and saves the day. They totally would. Like, you don't even need anyone else. No. Just, just the Justice League no. can handle it. No. Aaron Alexander Jones wrote, A scene where General Ross makes a move to capture the Hulk at the funeral. That's cold. Harrison Fox wrote, Captain America encountering Red Skull on Vormir. That would have been interesting to see. Colby Hentges wrote, Captain Marvel shaves a mohawk on a sleeping rocket while the rest of the Guardians watch. (laughs) That's pretty good. Nick Maiden wrote, The Avengers characters say, Oh shit, there's Adam Warlock. Now that's who we really needed. Which, of course, would have been a great shout out to the comics. Kenneth McNeese Jr. wrote, A scene showing how Banner was able to merge Banner and Hulk. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen that. A few radiation experiments that he performed on himself to get those results. George Carnitis wrote, The original Avengers go to get shawarma as a tribute to Stark and Black Widow, and as they go to order, the shop owner turns around to be revealed as Deadpool, who says, Sorry folks, we're fresh out of shawarma, but can I interest you in a chimichanga? That is my favorite answer. It was a great one. That is a really good answer. It was really damn good. It would have been a great way to introduce Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool, since we know he's sticking around. Right, right. Caleb Albers gave the answer, Old Cat picking up a newspaper with the headline, Tony Stark is Missing, with a closing shot of him smiling. Kind of sinister? Apparently that's a meme. I haven't seen it. I haven't either. Ken Johnson answered, An Irish wake following Tony's funeral, complete with drunken stories where Thor is mimicking the Iron Man suit. So kind of like a get-together scene that was in Age of Ultron. And Salvador Martinez gets the final honorable mention for his answer, Uncle Aaron comes back and sees his nephew five years older with powers that he obtained from snooping around an abandoned Oscorp building. And of course, his nephew is Miles Morales. And of course, Uncle Aaron is played by Donald Glover. The winners of this week's No Prize go to Tim Brown and Keon 1.0, who both basically wrote in a deleted scene of Natasha's funeral. Tim Brown wrote, Late at night, Fury, Steve, Thor, Rhodey, Hulk, Wanda, Sam, Clint, and his family have a silent personal vigil for Natasha. And Keon 1.0 wrote, The original Avengers standing around Natasha's grave reminiscing and saying their goodbyes, and as they leave, the Hulk stands behind, reverts back to Bruce, and places flowers over her grave. Oh, heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Gets you right in the feels. Right, right there. I mean, as great as the Deadpool Chimichanga answer was, I like this one a little bit more because even if Deadpool was in the movie, I still would have wanted to see a funeral scene for Natasha, some kind of remembrance, some kind of vigil, something for her. And I think both of these guys gave great answers that really tugged at the heartstrings. So congrats again to Tim Brown and Keon 1.0. You guys win this week's no prize. And if you, the listener, want to win your own no prize, go ahead and stay tuned to later on this episode when we will be asking another question of the week. And with that all out of the way, on to the news. So over the course of the past few weeks, some set photos have leaked of the Black Widow movie that's currently being shot in Budapest, Hungary, where apparently we're going to find out exactly what happened in Budapest with Black Widow. One of these shots confirms that the character Yelena Belova is going to be in the movie, and of course she is the secondary Black Widow, the blonde Black Widow, that appeared in the Marvel Knights comic books back in the early 2000s, and she was another spy to come out of the Soviet Red Room, kind of like Natasha's rival. Yeah, I remember you mentioning the Red Room in our Black Canary vs. Black Widow episode. Right, yeah. The other set photos that came out, though, were a little bit more exciting because it appears as if Taskmaster is going to be the primary villain in this film. We see shots of him riding in this armored tank car thing. And although he looks a little bit weird, I'm really excited that he's going to be in this movie because he's such a fantastic character. There's a lot of people questioning whether it's Taskmaster, but I mean, come on. Like, he has the skull helmet, he has a white hood, he has, like, blue and orange on his costume. Is it a skull helmet, or is it just evocative of a skull helmet? Because to me, actually, I'll be honest, when I first saw these photos, I actually thought that Darkhawk was going to be in the film. And I was so confused. I was like, why are they putting Darkhawk in a Black Widow film? Because he looks almost exactly like him, at least how he's shown in these set photos. But as you take a closer look, you realize that, yeah, the mask does kind of have this front section that makes it look like a skull. The costume does have a hood, which is iconic to Taskmaster, and he's carrying like this collapsible compound bow. 
And Taskmaster, of course, is a master of all weaponry. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Taskmaster. He's a Marvel villain and mercenary who is able to copy the fighting style of any person he sees. Yeah, instead of, like, photographic memory, he has, like, photographic physicality. Yeah, exactly. Fascinating character. We're gonna have to do a duel with him soon. Uh, Yeah, I can't wait to do a duel with him. Maybe with, like, Sportsmaster or something like that. We'll figure it out when the time comes. But this take on Taskmaster is certainly interesting. Now, the character in the comics has always had sort of like a medieval type of look with the hood and the armor and the sword and the shield. But this approach seems to be much more modern, almost borderline postmodern, like futuristic. It's in keeping with the aesthetic of the MCU. Right. Kind of like how Crossbones look was adapted for the Civil War movie. Exactly. In that same vein. Now, one of the things that's still up in the air about this film is exactly when it takes place. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that this may be like a flashback to what happened in Budapest, but this also may be a return to Budapest. Right, because one of the set photos reveals that she's driving a, a 2017 SUV. So it's also likely that this film takes place between the events of Civil War and Avengers Infinity War. But then again, wouldn't she have her blonde hair? Might be revealed that she ends up dyeing her hair blonde in a kind of homage to Yelena Belova, and that's why we see her that way in Infinity War. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. Who knows? But yeah, these are interesting shots. I really can't wait to get a clearer picture of what Taskmaster looks like, and hopefully they'll reveal that in the Hall H panel that they have at San Diego Comic-Con. Yeah, hopefully we'll get a trailer or something for this film. Yeah. Moving on to DC News, we got our first trailer for Teen Titans Go vs. Teen Titans. Now, this film was announced earlier, but we weren't sure if it was going to be direct-to-video or if it was going to be released in theaters. Right, just like the Teen Titans Go! the movie that came out last year. Exactly. This is a sequel to that because the very end credit scene for Teen Titans Go! to the movies, they teased the Teen Titans coming back. So I thought it would be in theaters, but it's it's not going to be. Probably due to the lackluster box office of the Teen Titans Go! to the movies movie. The box office was fine. It made money because it was so cheap to make. Uh Uh-huh. The animation is actually pretty cheaply done in Flash, which is actually one of the criticisms that this trailer is facing from fans right now, because Teen Titans Go! has always been animated in that style, but never Teen Titans. There's some people complaining that it's not like the traditional, less streamlined animation style, but it doesn't bother me too much. No, because it's easier to adapt the more serious Titans in that style than it would be to adapt the Teen Titans Go in a more traditional style. It just wouldn't look right. Exactly, exactly. So the trailer starts off with the Teen Titans Go in this arena that lights up and we see this character. I'm not sure who it is. It may be the Master of Games from the Teen Titans series, Uh but he wasn't blue in that series. This guy's blue and he's voiced by Reese Darby. Oh, Murray from Flight of the Concords. Exactly. And he's explaining how the Teen Titans Go are going to face their biggest challenge, and that ends up being the Teen Titans. Yeah, I like Robin's reaction. He's like, yes, a chance to show that we're the best Teen Titans in the multiverse. Right, and then they all charge each other, and the Ravens deduce that it's probably their father, Trigon, who is sort of orchestrating this whole thing. It was cool to see the two different versions of Trigon. The series Teen Titans version is like this huge character who looks very imposing, whereas the Teen Titans Go version of Trigon is just silly. That's the whole appeal of Teen Titans Go. (laughs) So it looks like the versus word in the title of Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans actually alludes more to the fact that they're being competitive while teaming up to take down the Trigons. Which I like as an approach. It does seem like the Teen Titans Go team gets more of the spotlight here in this trailer. Oh, absolutely. The Teen Titans team barely has any dialogue in this trailer. It looks like Teen Titans Go is absolutely going to steal the show. I mean, even the environment and the worlds they're in look like it's from Teen Titans Go and not from Teen Titans. So we'll see how people feel about that. I'm sure everyone's going to hate it because everyone hates Teen Titans Go. I personally don't mind it. I have been watching Teen Titans on DC Universe and it is very good. But I can live with both. So it'll be nice to see both of these teams in the same movie. Yeah, uh, we should be reviewing it here within like the next month or so, I guess, whenever it comes out. Yeah, I think it's coming out pretty soon. There's no official release date, but I imagine it'll be this summer or in the fall. Cool. Well, that brings us to our question of the week. Who are you rooting for? Teen Titans Go or Teen Titans and why? Post your answer to our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or email us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com. We'll pick our favorite answer and draw that person a Dynamic Duel No Prize that we'll post to social media. And I think that does it for all of the news from this episode. So let's get on to the duel portion where we pit Catwoman versus Hellcat. Bring it on. Oh, it's already been brought in.
Okay, Catwoman versus Hellcat. We are pitting these two characters against each other, of course, because they're both cat women. Right, yeah, they're both, you know, dressed up as cats. Neither of them really have superpowers that would give each other an advantage in battle, so uh, we thought they were pretty evenly matched here. Catwoman, of course, being the popular Batman-related character, and Hellcat being the less popular character, but who has played prominently in television media in the Marvel Netflix series through the character Trish, played by uh, Rachel Taylor, I consider her a primary member of the Defenders comic book team. Now, the main Defenders have always been Doctor Strange, the Silver Surfer, Hulk, and Namor, but there was kind of like this kind of B secondary group within that team with Valkyrie, Nighthawk, and Hellcat. Right, and both characters go back all the way to the Golden Age, I believe. Yeah, so they have a lot of history to them, which we'll get into pretty soon. But before that, if you haven't listened to one of our episodes, the way we approach these battles is through statistics. We take each character's statistics and run them through a probabilistic model known as the Monte Carlo simulation. Right, and what that does is it takes their base stat numbers and it randomizes it along a normal distribution, uh, which is represented by a bell curve. And that represents all the different variables that may take place during the course of battle. Now, we compare each character's statistics against each other 1,000 times to simulate 1,000 battles. And whoever has the higher percentage of wins, we declare the victor. Right. Now, no character ever wins 100% of the matches, especially if we've picked our matches correctly. Even the most powerful heroes sometimes lose to the weakest. Like, Batman always has a way to defeat Superman. And we feel like this is accurately represented through the Monte Carlo method. Right, and of course, that method is also used across a variety of applications, including video game AI and business risk analysis. Yes, and this method was also used in the Deadliest Warrior Spike television show to determine who would win between their warriors, such as like a Spartan and a ninja. So it's fairly scientific, fairly non-biased, being that both Jonathan and I are both extremely biased to the respective Marvel and DC companies. Right. So we don't consider anything like fan votes. We don't really take like feats into consideration because the character's top end feats usually tend to be not what is typical of the character. Right. We use the character's base stats based on the Marvel power rankings, which are official. From that, we extrapolate the DC stats and we incorporate a few other statistical categories just to make a more robust simulation. Right, but before we run the numbers, we like to detail each character's backstory and powers and then speculate on how we think one of these 1,000 matches would actually play out. So I think uh, you go first in this particular episode, so I'm interested in hearing all about the history of Catwoman. So before she became the femme fatale or feline fatale known as Catwoman, Selina Kyle was separated from her sister at a young age and raised in a Gotham City juvenile detention center after her mother committed suicide and her abusive father drank himself to death soon after. She eventually escaped the detention center and tried her hand at pickpocketing outside of a traveling carnival near Gotham. She was caught by the owner of the carnival, but instead of turning her into the police, he offered to have her join his traveling troop, which she accepted. While working for the carnival, Selena learned the art of contortionism, gymnastics, and sleight of hand. She left the carnival when the owner died in an accident, and she returned to Gotham, where she survived as a petty thief and prostitute, during which time she cared for a young underage girl named Holly Robinson, whom she protected from their abusive pimp, Stan. After one of his beatings landed her in the hospital, Selena was introduced through a sympathetic police detective to Ted Grant, aka Wildcat, one of the best martial artists on the planet who trained her on how to fight and use a bullwhip. Inspired by Batman, who you can learn more about in our Batman vs. Moon Knight episode, Selena left prostitution and fashioned herself a cat costume due to her love of cats and stalked Gotham's criminal elite as the cat burglar Catwoman. For one of her first heists, she targeted mob boss Carmine Falcone and left scratch mark scars across his face as a signature. Batman witnessed Catwoman attack Carmine, and while he did nothing at the time, they eventually got in each other's way, and Catwoman more often than not got away by seducing and tricking Batman. The two teamed up on occasion, notably during the long Halloween storyline when Harvey Dent became Two-Face and killed Carmine Falcone. While continuing to investigate the Falcone crime family, Selina traveled to Rome where she robbed the Vatican and discovered she may have been the daughter of Carmine Falcone and his first wife Luisa, who sent her to America where she was soon given up for adoption. She returned to Gotham and to her life of vigilant crime 
where she used her thieving skills altruistically, like when she stole a deadly toxin to prevent a terrorist attack, or somewhat more selfishly, like when she stole a cybernetic enabler to save a friend in the hospital. After a massive earthquake struck Gotham, Selina ran out of money as she stayed in the designated no man's land to help others trapped there. As Gotham City recovered, Selina became disillusioned with the glamorous lifestyle and moved to Gotham's East End to look out for others. She found her old friend Holly working the streets again, though Selina convinced her to be an undercover informant and help her protect people on the street. Together, the two helped bring down crooked cops working for the villain Black Mask. Using millions of dollars of stolen money, Selena opened a community center in East End to help the neighborhood. She had a surprise visit from her sister Maggie and her husband during the center's opening ceremony, but that night, the community center was destroyed in an explosion. Catwoman chased down the bombers, but they were killed before she could interrogate them, and Holly, Maggie, and her husband were all kidnapped by the time she got back. Catwoman discovered Black Mask was behind the bombing and kidnapping, but by the time she tracked Black Mask down, Maggie had been tortured and her husband was killed. Whoa. Catwoman seemingly killed Black Mask and rescued her sister and Holly, though Maggie had gone insane from the ordeal and had to be admitted to a psychiatric hospital. After surviving a fight with Superman and nearly killing the Joker, Batman finally revealed his identity as Bruce Wayne to Catwoman. Their romance blossomed for a time until Catwoman learned that she, like many supervillains, may have been mentally manipulated in the past by Zatanna and the Justice League, which you can learn more about in our Zatanna vs Scarlet Witch episode. Catwoman feared that her feelings for Batman and heroic tendencies were results from that manipulation. She let Holly take up the mantle of Catwoman for a while, during which time Selina gave birth to a daughter named Helena who may have been the result of a one night stand with an undercover cop. When the supervillain film freak deduced that Catwoman was Selina Kyle, Catwoman enlisted Zatanna's help to mind wipe the villain and protect her daughter. Knowing her lifestyle was too dangerous for a child, Selina had Bruce Wayne help arrange Helena's adoption, and she and Batman resumed their romantic relationship. After Selina had her literal heart stolen by the villain Hush, Batman recovered the organ and it was surgically replaced, after which Catwoman tortured Hush and stole the villain's entire family fortune. After Batman's death soon after, Catwoman helped protect the streets by forming the team known as Gotham City Sirens with the villains Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn, the latter of whom you can learn more about in our Harley Quinn vs Domino episode. Harley and Ivy helped Catwoman save her sister Maggie from the resurrected Black Mask during the Blackest Night event. Maggie escaped the ordeal, murdered a nun, and dressed in her bloody gown, becoming the villain Sister Zero, who attempted to exorcise the cat demon from her sister, who had ruined both of their lives. Okay. In the New 52, Catwoman was drafted into Amanda Waller's Justice League of America, as she was considered the perfect foil to go against Batman. She eventually left the team after she broke into Argus headquarters and deleted the file they had on her. She learned that her father was actually a mobster currently locked up in Blackgate Penitentiary known as Rex Calabrese, from whom Carmine Falcone had usurped his mob power, and for a time, Selina became the head of the rising Calabrese crime family. After she was wrongfully arrested and put on death row for the mass murder of over 200 terrorist soldiers, Batman rescued Selina and discovered the killer was actually her friend Holly. Selina took up her Catwoman mantle again, and she and Batman rekindled their romance. Batman proposed marriage to Selina, and she accepted, though she left him at the altar after being convinced by her friend Holly, who was secretly working for Bane, that making Batman happy would lead to his and Gotham's undoing. Hmm. Now, Catwoman has no superhuman abilities, though she's one of the foremost thieves in DC Comics. She's a skilled contortionist and acrobat, and an expert in the martial arts of boxing, capoeira, dragon-style kung fu, and more. She's also a master of seduction and silent stealth, and she's equipped with retractable steel claws in her gloves and boots, as well as her signature bullwhip. Now, depending on the costume she's wearing, Catwoman also has worn infrared goggles or worn a utility belt with gadgets such as caltrops, bolas, 
and tracking devices. And what costume will she be wearing during this fight? That's a good question. I don't know if I should determine that, honestly. I think for the sake of this battle, she's probably just going to have her bullwhip because that's been one consistent thing throughout her entire history. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine with that, being that Hellcat doesn't have any weapons of her own. Now, Hellcat actually has a huge history within Marvel Comics, the publisher, dating all the way back to the Golden Age. Let me go ahead and get into her history. Patricia Walker was born in Centerville, California to Joshua Walker, a comic book writer, and Dorothy Walker. As a child, Patsy began modeling and acting, with Dorothy serving as her agent. Her biggest exposure, however, came from a comic book called Patsy Walker, which in real life was an actual comic book Marvel put out in the 1940s after World War II ended and readers became less interested in superhero comics and more interested in romantic comics. Patsy was huge, starring in multiple comic series that ran until the 1960s. These books were retconned into the Marvel Universe continuity as fictionalized stories about Patsy's teenage years with her friends Heedy and Buzz. Patsy was never comfortable with her mother's exploits of her personal life through the comics and was grateful when the series ended. But Patsy was fascinated with the medium itself and idolized all the superheroes featured in other comic books, desperately wanting to be a superhero herself. Hmm. After a longtime teen romance with Buzz, Patsy married him and moved with him to several military bases before he was eventually assigned a security post at the government-subsidized Brand Corporation. At the time, Hank McCoy, aka Beast, was working at Brand, conducting genetic research. This was before he experimented on himself and became furry and blue. Patsy discovered that Hank was a secret mutant and a member of the X-Men superhero team. She confronted him and promised to keep his secret safe if he helped her one day become a superhero herself. Oh, blackmail. And he agreed. Years passed, and Patsy and Buzz's marriage eventually ended. Remembering Hank's promise, she went looking for him and saw that he was now blue and furry and a member of the Avengers. As she shadowed the team during an investigation into Brand, she and the Avengers were captured by the corporation and her ex-husband, Buzz. There, Patsy found an old yellow costume used by the Avenger Tigra, who used to go by the superhero name, The Cat before she was transformed into a half-cat being. Since Tigra was no longer using the outfit, Patsy donned it and took on the name Hellcat, helping the team escape Brand by slashing Buzz's face. Patsy was offered membership in the Avengers, but she instead chose to travel to Saturn's moon Titan, where she could study advanced martial arts and train in psychic abilities under Moon Dragon, a psychic superhero who was the daughter of Drax. On Titan, Patsy received organic enhancements that gave her minor psychic potential. When she came back to Earth, she fought alongside Doctor Strange and joined his superhero team, the Defenders, alongside the Hulk, Silver Surfer, the Submariner, Nighthawk, and Valkyrie. She became a mainstay of that team, being the only member of the team that could calm down the Hulk. While with the Defenders, she met Damon Hellstrom, who was the son of Satan cured of his demonic aspect. Damon joined the team as the superhero Hellstorm, and he and Patsy fell in love. Eventually, they married and retired from the Defenders and from costume superheroics. They moved to San Francisco, where they assisted the West Coast Avengers with any paranormal investigations. Over time, the demonic aspect of Damon's soul remanifested, and Patsy was driven mad to learn her husband was the demon spawn of Satan. She was in a near vegetable state for months before a villain named Deathurge convinced her to euthanize herself. She died, and her spirit went to a realm of Mephistos in hell called the Arena of Tainted Souls. When the team, the Thunderbolts, traveled to Mephisto's realm, led by Hawkeye in order to resurrect his deceased wife Mockingbird, Damon tricked them into resurrecting Patsy instead. Depressed over her time in hell, Patsy went home to Centerville, California, where she found that her fame as a teen star had turned the small town into a tourist attraction. Her time in the underworld gave her a supernatural sense, and she learned Centerville was overrun with a cult called the Sons of the Serpents. She called the Avengers and fought the cult alongside them, back in costume as Hellcat. She rejoined the reformed Defenders team and became friends with She-Hulk, who forced her to register under the Superhuman Registration Act during the events of Civil War. Now under government sanction, she was assigned to fight crime in Alaska. There she uncovered a plot involving the kidnapped daughter of a group of witches, and she also wrote an autobiography of her life. Eventually, she came back to New York to join She-Hulk's new private law practice as her in-house case investigator. 
During this time, she discovered that reprints of her old comics were becoming wildly popular, and with the help of She-Hulk and Jessica Jones, Patsy won a legal case against her old friend Heedy for the rights to the comic. Since then, Heedy has sought revenge against Patsy through behind-the-scenes manipulations such as convincing Patsy's ex-husbands Buzz and Damon to attack Patsy, and starting a relationship with a demon named Belial in order to curse Patsy. And that's pretty much her story up to this point. Now, powers-wise, Hellcat's physical abilities are enhanced to their full potential through her cat suit, as well as her extensive physical training on Titan. Through her cat suit, she has enhanced hearing and night vision, as well as retractable steel alloy claws on her gloves and boots that can scratch through stone. And she has a grappling hook. Her training under Moondragon, as well as her time spent in Hell, has left her with a sensitivity to psychic and supernatural phenomena, as well as a resistance to psychic and magical attacks. She is also an adept acrobat and martial artist with an expertise in Moondragon's titanium fighting style. And that's Hellcat. Methinks someone tried to cash in on the success of Catwoman on this one. <laughs> well, I mean, technically, I think Patsy might predate Catwoman since Patsy came out in 1945. No, Catwoman actually debuted in 1940, but she debuted as the cat. Oh, really? Yeah. The Avenger Tigra used to be called the cat. Yeah, and she's also a ripoff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Fucking Marvel, man. <laughs> what can you do? What are you going to do about it? Beat your ass in this match. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do about it. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. So uh, now that we've gotten the histories out of the way, we like to speculate on how we think one of the 1,000 simulations that we run will actually play out in kind of an improvised scenario. Now, we don't set any rules for the scenario other than that the characters don't know anything about each other upon meeting, but they do know that they have to take each other down as threats. They start about 50 yards apart from each other, and they fight in a location that has no bearing on the match itself. Right, because we don't take statistics for the environment. Right, so each character has to win on their own merit without using outside help. So let's go ahead and get into it. Catwoman versus Hellcat. Who goes first? This is going to be a tough one for Catwoman, just because she uses the environment so much to her, her advantage as a stealth character. Uh-huh. Hellcat isn't quite so stealthy, like her costume is, you know, bright yellow right. and blue, so right. she definitely doesn't have that going for her. That being said, she's a go-getter, and I think Catwoman might be just like a little bit smarter, a little bit more pensive, even though she is a villainous type character. I actually think Hellcat would go first. Okay. So she's going to run across the field doing front hand springs to cover the distance and leap high into the air and come down with this devastating slash attack across Catwoman's face. Okay, but as Hellcat is approaching, Catwoman pulls out her bullwhip and wraps it around Hellcat's wrist as she's coming down, okay? Mm-hmm. And she yanks on it, deflecting Hellcat's attack. Okay, so Hellcat lands on the ground in, like, this cool, like, cat pose, and her wrist is bound by this whip, and so she grabs the whip and she yanks it, and it pulls right out of Catwoman's hand. No, because Catwoman still holds onto it, and as she gets yanked forward, she uses that momentum to do, like, this front flip kick straight to Hellcat's face. Okay, well, using the momentum of getting kicked in the face, <laughs> Hellcat spins around, her wrist still bound by the whip, right, and spins around Catwoman and pulls the whip around Catwoman's throat, choking her out in, like, a Garrett attack. <laughs> you can't use the momentum from getting kicked in the face. Sure you can. <laughs> it's a spinning around. Yes, first of can. all, first of all, the angle she was kicked would knock her down to the ground, not, like, have her twirl <laughs> around magically <laughs> in a Okay, well, if it knocked way. her down, that means she used the momentum of her head being knocked down to <laughs> the ground <laughs> to do a handspring up into the air to still eventually get around Catwoman's no. backside. Yes. <laughs> that's not how that works. She's that good of an acrobat. Her titanium martial arts training teaches her how to use momentum to her advantage. And that could include redirection from being attacked. It's a thing. Okay, so she, as... She knows how to roll with it. Okay, whatever. So as Catwoman is being choked out, that's when she reaches with her claws behind her and just, like, digs her nails into Hellcat's face and leaves deep scratches in her face. And that makes her let go of the whip. Well, I mean, Hellcat has long, flowing hair that comes out of her mask. So... Catwoman really didn't do as much damage as she thought she Hair did. Hair does not protect steel blades. I mean, it, it provided some protection in the same way, a, you know, a lion's mane would protect their oh neck. Oh my fucking gosh. <laughs> so, I mean, it didn't do quite as much damage as you would suspect, but it probably did cut some of her hair. And, you know, Patsy's fucking pissed by that. I bet. So she lets go of the whip and just boots Catwoman right in the small of her back, sending her flying right onto her face. Okay, but Catwoman uses the momentum <laughs> to, <laughs> to do a front handspring. 
At which yeah. point, during mid handspring, she uses her whip to grab Hellcat's ankle, yanks it, so now Hellcat's on the ground. All right, by this point, Hellcat's just over the whip. So she uses her claws to slash that motherfucker. It renders it useless and frees her ankle. Okay, now it's Catwoman's turn to be pissed. Because <laughs> she really liked that whip. <laughs> So as Hellcat is on the ground, removing the, the snare from her ankle, that's when Cowman just leaps towards her, claws forward, and just slashes the heck out of her chest. So Patsy's like, ah, and she has this huge, like, slash marks across her costume. Like, yeah. Oh, no, this yeah. is going to get dangerous. <laughs> but Hellcat slashes back, and she slashes Catwoman's chest. And I don't like where this is going. <laughs> and now both of the their costumes... Let's not turn this right, into right, one right. of those. Right, okay. I'm trying my hardest. <laughs> So she gets slashed. Both of her costumes are still pretty much fully intact. Right, right, right. It's not really revealing. No, not at all. Let's establish that. (laughs) Okay, but Catwoman follows up Hellcat's attack by grabbing Hellcat's hair and just holding it as she repeatedly punches her in the Ah. face. Yeah, that's that's why you hide your hair. (laughs) Shit. Well, while Hellcat's getting punched in the face, she, like, reaches her clawed hand around Catwoman's mask and slashes to reveal Selena Kyle's own hair, which she starts yanking. It's short, her hair is short. It's not gonna like fall uh, out of the costume. Okay, well then Patsy discovers this and is still probably getting punched in the face. <laughs> and then she kicks Catwoman away, right in the solar plexus, real hard. Okay. So Catwoman has like the, the breath knocked out of her. And at this point, Hellcat straight up pounces and tackles Catwoman and starts ripping her to shreds. On the floor? Okay, then Catwoman like rolls over. Now she's on top of Hellcat and she like spanks her tush. <laughs> we are horrible. We are not the right people for this. This is a literal cat fight. What are you supposed to do? Well, Patsy's offended. She's not having that at all. So she, she kicks backwards and connects with Catwoman's stomach with her clawed boots. So Catwoman is now like punctured in the stomach. Right. Oh, I don't want this to be sexy and violent. I know, me neither, me neither. <laughs> Well, that Catwoman's like, you bitch! <laughs> and then she takes her own clawed foot and kicks Hellcat in the back. And then and then Hellcat spins around real quick and shoots Catwoman point blank with her four clawed grappling hook. So it's kind of like what Rorschach did to that police officer in Watchmen. Uh-huh. So it, just like the impact just incapacitates Catwoman and she's knocked down to the ground unconscious. Hellcat wins. No, no, Catwoman sees this coming, so she dodges the grapple and then, like, slices the cable line and uses that line, since she's an expert with a whip, to knock Hellcat out. Oh, that was pretty good. If it happened, I don't think Catwoman actually dodged that attack. But we'll go ahead and leave the match there, since there's really nowhere else for for this to go. Either Catwoman didn't dodge the attack and she lost, or Hellcat falls to her own weapon. Let's go ahead and run the stats on these two characters and come back with a winner. Okay, we are no longer allowed to do two <laughs> female characters in sexy cat costumes right. with, who have slashing abilities. Exactly. I mean, well, we did do Katana versus Elektra, but the, nothing really happened there. No, Elektra's costume was already, like, half gone anyway. Right. Oh, God. All right. Um, so we ran the stats on these two characters, and they were pretty much nearly identical. There were a few discrepancies in that Catwoman is an expert of more fighting styles than Hellcat is. Although the bullwhip that Catwoman has doesn't grant her nearly as much of an advantage as you would think it does, because its range is only eight feet. Right, and Hellcat is skilled enough to make up for that distance pretty easily. Right. So they're fairly close. Now, Catwoman is pretty much peak human in terms of her physical abilities. Hellcat's costume was made by a scientist to grant any woman who wears it peak human physical abilities as well. Which is weird, because it doesn't seem like a tech suit at all. I don't know how it works, honestly. (laughs) That's dumb. (laughs) Dumb Marvel. But anyway, physicality-wise, they're equal. Intelligence-wise, they're about equal. Especially when you factor in Hellcat's psychic and supernatural proclivities. But again, those are mainly geared towards magic. So again, they wouldn't really help her in this fight as as much as you would think. Right. So we have the results. Uh, Who do you think came out on top? Um, I think Catwoman did, just because she's a slightly more studied fighter, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. And the results agree with you because Catwoman won 56.8% of the time. She won 568 out of the 1,000 matches as compared to Hellcat's 432 wins. I kind of felt like this was coming, honestly, because yeah, Catwoman is a slightly better fighter. She does have the bullwhip, whereas Hellcat has no bullwhip. She just has that grappling hook, but it's not really an effective, you know, combat weapon. Right. 
So that makes sense. I don't even feel bad about this. It was a close duel and the characters were fairly evenly matched. So I'm satisfied with this. This is fine. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy it as well. I really liked learning about Hellcat a little bit more. It would have been cool if Rachel Taylor would have gotten her own Hellcat series. No, nah, she's a bad guy. Yeah, well, she's show. a bad guy now, but she could be reformed. But anyway, that does it for this match. Go ahead and let us know what you guys thought about it uh, by writing into us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or you can email us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, dynamicduel.com, to listen to all of our episodes, learn more about Jonathan and I, and check out cool merchandise that we sell through Tee Public. Yeah, the link to our merchandise store is on our website. And if you use that link, you'll get a discount on your first order. For this episode, I'm going to be uploading some Catwoman art. And who doesn't want Catwoman swag? So I think that does it for this episode. In our next episode, we will be reviewing Spider-Man Far From Home. And oh crap, I do not have my tickets yet. Well, that movie actually comes out the day that this podcast episode drops. And that's the day that I'll be seeing it, so I'm really excited. A lot of people are saying amazing things about this Spider-Man film. They're saying that the trailers don't even cover nearly anything about this massive, massive film. Yeah, they're saying it's like the best Spider-Man movie that's ever come out. Which is fascinating to me. I can't wait to see it. But yeah, we'll be reviewing that in next week's episode. So definitely check us out then. Don't forget to answer the question of the week. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Or share the show with someone that you think would enjoy it. And also, please don't forget to rate and review us. Again, we're trying to get to 200 ratings on Apple Podcasts. That would be fantastic. Yes. All right, we'll talk to you guys next week. If you're a member of Patreon, remember that you get a bonus blooper episode on Patreon at the first of the next month. Everybody have a happy 4th of July. If you're in America. If you're in America, and have fun watching Spider-Man. Up, up, and away. True believers.